four decades ago, Elton John set these words to music. Torn from their families, mothers go hungry to feed their children, but the children go hungry. There's so many big men, they're out making millions. When poverty profits, just blame the children. If there's a God in heaven, what's he waiting for? If he can't hear the children, then he must see the war. But it seems to me that he leads his lambs to the slaughterhouse and not the promised land. Dying for causes they don't understand, we've been taking their futures right out of their hands. They need the handouts to hold back the tears. There's so many crying, but so few that hear. If there's a God in heaven, well, what's he waiting for? Have you ever asked John's question? People are not good with delay. Last year's miracles mean little during today's crisis. This message should come with a warning. You don't want to hear it. Or maybe I should just admit, I don't want to preach this message. Who accepts an assignment to preach an obscure passage from an apocalyptic canon seven centuries before Jesus taught us how to pray? Now, to be clear, I wasn't asked then to do this. Maybe that much lead time would offer you a better message. I'm reflecting on the words from then, the ancient wisdom preserved by a people who found in these words hope. Like every preacher, bringing forth the biblical text as scripture, I'm challenged to handle with respect the records of a people I do not know, to allow this episode in their memory to bring to our recollection the promise and presence of the Creator God. For those who are prone to take the Bible more literally than seriously— The text of this often overlooked prophetic book can easily be dismissed as ancient history, the playground for some Hebrew Bible scholar in search of an obscure textual criticism to obtain yet another academic credential. Or worse, a metaphorical reading of these reports from the final decade of Israel's southern kingdom construing criticism of the failure of God's people to set the right standards for a society that does not know Israel's God, warning of imminent end-time destruction, whether by rapture or revolution. As history repeats itself, one of the greatest cities in the world is about to be sacked by an allied army whose combined forces swoop onto the set like the choreographed scenes in the Avengers Endgame. And just as in the movie, reflections of reality of a multiverse of alternative responses leave us intoxicated and distracted by the what-ifs that take residence in our imaginations when we linger before the tree of knowledge to discern what is good and evil, because the creator of the universe seems to be holding back on us with those empty promises and unrealized potential. There seems to be a little to invite us to linger in this prophetic account. Now, that three-minute introduction is like a trailer for a soon-to-be-released blockbuster, which can be binge-watched at your convenience. So I encourage you to pay close attention to what the prophet Habakkuk is saying, and pray with me as I share a few thoughts on the word, God's next move. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Creator, covenanting God, whatever it seems, whenever it seems that you are silent, we fill the room with our request, our needs, our wants to change the world, our hopes and our fears that this too must pass. But then what? Amen. The writer Habakkuk sees the rising threat on the horizon, a people whose religious commitments mocked those of his community, governments whose policies and practices of imperial pacification conquer an entire people group, deporting them en masse to the capital city like the victors in the Hunger Games. And in this prophetic account, unlike others, 
we are privy to the conversations between Katniss and Peta rather than fraught with the tutorial of Hammond or to return to the Marvel Universe, this is not Nick Fury offering plans for the next attack. This is Natasha Romanoff asking, what if there just might be a future with Bruce Banner? A pleading, a reconsideration of the possibility of good when there is so much evil and tragedy in their world. As many as now recognize this is a, a lament. This word is not criticism of Israel. This is not warning of what is to come. As the mortal tries to comprehend good in the midst of evil, this ancient text allows us to eavesdrop on a prophet's conversation with the creator of the universe. You see, Habakkuk knows the promise of God, promises that suggest the situation the people now find themselves in is not God's intention for them. And yet, those promises, those promises of God, remain unfulfilled. Bloodshed and casual conversations about wars, breach of contract, prejudice, brutality, abhorrent labor practices, marital infidelity, or closer to home, the very destruction of community. I'm not talking about nation against nation, but family against family, brother against sister, husband against wife, parents against children. Lies, deceit, abuse, rape, from the gossip that destroys egos to the arrogance that destroys nation, the world was not a place of peace and prosperity. Thriving and abundance were constrained to a small class. Togetherness and accord exists only in the shared grievances of the masses. How do we speak of good news in times like these? How do we speak of good news in the wake of earthquakes in Alaska and fires from Connecticut to California? How do we speak of good news when cancer and COVID and inadequate health care steals the lives of our loved ones and countless strangers? How do we speak of good news when law enforcement is as violent as street gangs? And when an 18-year-old can drive across the state to a community marketplace to live stream a mass killing of members of another ethnic group, and the aftermath is mostly a continued debate of whether when one disregards the humanity of another, are they representative of a systemic problem or just a single lost individual? How do you speak of good news when the nation that has been a light to the world looks just as dark as everybody else? Okay, are you still with me? I told you that this would be not an easy message, but we're not the first to struggle with this question. Habakkuk is speaking to God about all that he sees, and it is horrible. So with complaint, he goes to the creator. He grumbles to God. Unapologetically, he lists his frustrations to the Lord. And God handles it. God is not so small-minded to be irritated by our questions. God is not so weak to be disturbed by our complaint. God is not so insecure to be bothered by our honesty. And so the prophet complains, look at what I see, violence and injustice, idolatry and evil. How long will you allow this? The days of Habakkuk and the days of, John, of Elton John four decades ago are not unlike our days. Their questions are our questions. One in faith of the prophet in one in doubt of the cultural icon. How are you questioning God? In faith or in doubt? And what is this faith? I'm glad you asked. Faith is the confidence that what God will do is what God has promised always to do. Faith is the hope 
that allows us to keep on keeping on when everything is going wrong. Faith is believing in what is promised even when it looks a long way out. And before we turn to pre-recorded sermons and podcasts, worshipers would walk into a sanctuary generally once a week and simply sit on a pew. You didn't shake the pew. You didn't test the pew. It worked last week, and though you haven't checked it ever, no one suspects that the pew would not, pew would not support you. That's faith. The pew that you sat in last week will sustain you this week. Now, In this metaphorical simile, I'm trying to say, turning on a computer and hoping the recording streams without interruption disrupts such ease of faith. We are all a bit more cautious. Faith is a little harder to come by, say in places like Flint, Michigan, where just a few years ago, mothers turned on the water that had always been safe and it poisoned their children. It's no wonder that we have faith in the United States, where a system of oppression and inequality have been its practice from its beginning and it was as it was established as a slave nation. And yet we have this hope that she may one day live into her stated values of liberty and justice for all. It's a wonder that we have faith. The systems of this world are no less evil than they were in the days of Habakkuk. And we rightly ask the question, how long, God? And the miracle, the mystery, the wonder is God's response to our questions is not anger, it's not judgment, but again with the promise, God will judge the evil. Just wait for it. What is described for Habakkuk as a equivalent to the national situation we're living in today. The worst of a nation is on display for the world to view. Greed, military might, ethnocentric arrogance, racial supremacy, inequitable labor practices, failed systems. Whatever your, whatever your position is on abortion or critical race theory, gender identity or immigration, regardless of your opinion on gun control, minimum wage, Russian, uh, NATO, Elon Musk, David Chappelle or Meghan McCain, what is happening before us on live TV, reported on Twitter and celebrated in political polls leaves us with the same question of happening. Really, God? This is your response? Habakkuk is bothered that God has chosen to use an evil power to rise up and destroy the hypocrisy and injustice of his chosen people. Really, God? Now, the lectionary splices and cuts this little text, so I invite you to read the whole four chapters yourself. Come on, it's not like I'm asking you to binge watch the entire 24 movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in preparation for understanding the multiverse, though that would really help. But I'm digressing. What we divide as the first two chapters is a back and forth argument between God and Habakkuk. The prophet sets the problem. God offers a solution. Point one. Habakkuk points out how the Torah is being neglected. There's violence and inequity everywhere. And all is instigated by the institutional leaders. The prophet is pleading with God, do something and nothing. But wait for it. Just as God heard the cry of ancient Israel enslaved by an Egyptian Pharaoh who didn't know his own nation's history, God not only responds, but clarifies that Israel's situation has not gone without divine notice. And very aware of what is going on, God is about to do something. But this moment, this is not the moment that God has promised. This is the path our disobedience has placed us on. And like our GPS when we turn in the wrong direction, God says, recalculating. Have you ever done that? Just turn the wrong way, see what the route guidance system will do? 
It's like the Holy Spirit as counselor and advocate. She just recalculates again and again and again because the destination has been set and we will get there in due time. But don't cue the commercial just yet. We have to wait for it. We are not the first to be impatient with waiting. Recently liberated from slavery, ancient Israel rushed to build a golden calf to worship when God and Moses were contracting a society of holiness of which the ancient world had never seen. And their descendants would ask for a king. And God graciously steps aside to give them a human ruler that they demanded. Expecting a Messiah, the Jews followed many who displayed military might, offering a promise to make Israel great again. If the Messiah isn't coming, we have to do something. If Moses isn't dead, then let's make us a God. If everyone else has a king, then let's be like them. Ungodly behavior escalates as it seems that there are no consequences. I mean, if Jesus isn't coming back, there's no judgment to worry about, right? If God is holding out on us, and can't we hold out on God? Which brings me back to Elton John's question. If there's a God in heaven, what's he waiting for? And that's just it. Listen with me again to the prophetic lament. It's not God who's waiting. It's us. We are waiting for God's next move. So what are you doing? while you wait on God's next move. Bishop Ken Carter of the United Methodist Church once said it like this, God has made some astounding yet unfulfilled promises. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spheres into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation and neither shall they be learn war anymore. Or this one, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Or another reminds us that faith is holding on to God's promises and living toward them even when there's no evidence that they will be fulfilled. That kind of faith is difficult and it's rare. But the creator of the the God who is the creator of the universe, God's waiting. He's waiting as the one who rescued the enslaved Israelites in ancient Egypt, the enslaved Africans in 19th century Britain and the United States, and the enslaved humans in the 20th century. This God is waiting. The God whom Jesus reveals as Father is waiting. The God who believes in humanity's capacity to practice righteousness is waiting. The God who makes promises is waiting. So to borrow the phrase, there is a God in heaven. And the answer to the question is simple. It's us. You and me. We are who God is waiting for. Ask. You shall receive. Seek. You shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. But it's not easy to pray, have thine own way, Lord. It's contrary to public opinion. Because God's way, as it was in the ancient text, may mean judging human arrogance. Or God's way might mean sitting down with Pharisees. God's way may mean allowing your enemies to run a victory lap. Or God's way might mean accepting the immigrant. God's way may mean they get a hashtag, a protest, and a political campaign. Or God's way might send you back home to seek and offer forgiveness. What if God's way is to form you as a prophet rather than a politician, a pastor rather than a chaplain? What if God's way is to tell you to wait? Just a little bit longer. It's not easy to pray, have thine own way, Lord. I don't know what that means for you, 
But I know that in the past, God has been transforming the world and the people in it and restoring the good of creation from the midst of chaos. God's presence creates good in the universe. The God of Adam and Eve gives us a covenant before sending us out into exile, famished in the shame of sinking our teeth into portions of indulgence. Social displacement is not the end of the story. The God of Cain provides protective custody for those bearing the guilt of execution of another human. Murder doesn't kill the transforming capacity of God's grace. The God of Abraham and Sarah seeks the elderly, even those worn down by unproductivity and jealousy. And God gives them strength to guide the next generation to be a holy people, a people who live in this world with a part of the com- as a part of the community of every nation, tongue, and tribe who work and walk and worship together as the children of a living God. This God of Joseph is interrupting family feuds so a hated brother with a dream can grow up to be a decision maker who brings equity to a country in famine where hope unborn has died in systems of abhorrent labor practices. The God of Israel breaks the government's back and offers humanity a handbook for holiness. The God of Israel, of Isaiah and Paul, who once revealed his glory in a temple made by hands, has promised to let his grace seep through the cracked pots of clay, the earthen vessels of humanity called to be transcripts of the Trinity. The creator of the universe who spent the night in a stable so that instead of Israel paying taxes to Caesar, wise men from the east arrived bearing gifts past a wicked king to the cradle of the king of kings. This God is Israel's God, the one Jesus called Father, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, the one who promised to always be where two or three are gathered in his name. And even now, the movement started by a few self-employed Middle Easterners and a tax collector rocks the world. So when the fires of Pentecost burned low, he gave fresh strength to a dropout and sent a reformation, a great awakening and a revival for his church. That same God that upheld David and Paul, Deborah and Ruth, Calvin and Wesley, Mother Teresa and Pope Francis has strength for you. It's not easy to pray that prayer, open my eyes, have thine own way, but maybe. It's the start of a conversation like the prophet Habakkuk had that ends with God and us saying, have thine own way. So while we wait, I invite you to be a peculiar people, not just saved by grace, but sanctified by the outpouring of your spirit. Christianity requires more recognizable behavior than a Christ-like Uh, that is Christ-like than vocal claims to follow Jesus. Hashtag Jesus is not a Twitter feed. Among those who are oppressed and ignore, ignored and manipulated and lie and kill, let us do good. Let us seek justice. Let us help the oppressed. Let us defend the cause of the orphan and fight for the rights of the widows. Let us set the captives fee, set Let us set the captives free because God's delay is God's grace. And grace is always God's next move. So hold out for each other the responsibility to be the opportunity of change. Grant us your wisdom, O God. Give us your strength that we might be the answer to someone else's prayer. God, As we demand of you, may we be willing to let you demand of us. God, let us trust you as Habakkuk did, to be able to allow us to be your move while we wait on your next move. Because you hear our prayer. You heed our prayer. And today... We need to trust that you are gathering us to be your people in a horrific world that show the world what holiness really looks like. Amen.